Welcome to our latest webinar for corporates. In this series, we'll be examining recent events and looking ahead at what might be in store for financial markets and the economy. Welcome to the March edition of the FX webinar, uh, joined again by Piers, um, who's going to deliver the technical outlook. Um, but I'm going to move forward quickly because uh, there's quite a lot to get through today with the economic outlook. And let's move away from that picture as quickly as uh, we possibly can. Uh, nobody wants to see that for too long. Um, so the contents of the presentation, as usual, starting very high level, although we're going to not look at GDP forecast like we did last month. We're going to look at the PMIs. Move on to um, what's happening in inflation, just some trends there. And I've, I've also included an additional that's come up several times in client meetings, which I think is an important potential driver for inflation pressures to come. We'll then look at what central banks are doing and what they'll do next, followed by a look at fiscal policy with the spring statement looming large on the horizon, and then look at the latest forecasts. Um, that we have um, produced. Uh, then there's a disclaimer and we'll hand over to Piers. So moving swiftly on and, and going on to sentiment, um, you know, it has improved. We've seen things like the manufacturing and services PMIs improving quite materially over the last month or two. Services PMI in particular from the likes of Euroland and the UK has been a, a notable improver in terms of rising back above 50 level. So suggesting that there is an expansion underway in services. I would just sort of issue a note of caution here with regard to the improvement that we're seeing in terms of that on a month by month basis, these numbers don't tend to accurately track activity. Um, you know, it's more a generic trend that we're looking at here. So it might be that we're seeing some improvement in, in underlying sentiment, but not actually seeing an improvement in order books or indeed in output. You know, I would question whether this is a bounce in activity or rather a smaller decline than that which was expecting. Uh, and certainly when we've spoken to clients, they are still seeing order books challenged and under pressure. Um, so uh, it's worthwhile noting that in terms of when you're looking at these surveys, perhaps having some context around what's what's happening in reality. And I think the improvement that we're seeing is also due to a general improvement in global confidence. So we've seen equity markets rising and, and um, an improvement there, although not across the board. Still seeing some pressure being brought to bear on, on things like the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. Um, and uh, and the, the, the other thing is that some of this may be consumers adjusting to a new reality. And I'd, um, I'd hasten to add into that, that we saw some what looked like robust figures out of the British Retail Consortium overnight. But actually, when you dig into the detail, it was an improvement in sales values because of much higher prices and sales volumes were considerably lower on the back of those higher prices. So underlying all of this is some inflation elements that, that may be elevating the short-term uh, levels of activity and earnings for businesses. Uh, but it does perhaps hint that we might be past the peak pessimism that we saw going all the way back to um, late last year, early this year. Um, we might see some improvement from here on in in terms of these sorts of surveys, including things like consumer confidence, which has also improved. If we look at what's happening in inflation now, this next slide shows that inflation is, is coming off, although you can see US headline inflation and European headline inflation rates look as if they might be stalling slightly. Remember on the way up, they also stalled on a, on a couple of occasions, so that, that's nothing to be alarmed by. Um, I think there will still be additional drops in inflation rates driven by lower energy prices. And those lower energy prices will help to bring down the cost of production um, across a broad swathe of sectors, particularly in things like food manufacturing as well. Um, so all of that um, will help to limit further increases in prices. But remember, there is a staggered approach to a lot of price rises, particularly in the food industry. So we might still have some latent effects of those higher energy prices that we saw towards the back end of 2022 um, in, impacting on prices in the short term. So the next sort of three or six months, I think we should then, then be able to suggest that we've reached that peak 
and we've come off uh, as far as food price inflation is concerned. But the other chart, the right-hand chart, is about shipping costs. I think this is a much more material barometer of what's going on with regard to global demand. And global demand is down very, very sharply. This is something that's come up uh, in recent conversations that we've had with clients, um, that they're seeing their shipping costs fall very dramatically, albeit that we have seen shipping companies take some capacity out of freight lines as well. So, um, it's undoubtedly uh, being driven by lower levels of demand, um, but we might see prices stabilize now as far as shipping costs are concerned because that capacity is being withdrawn from the supply side. Um, I do think that we will get a further improvement, as I say, in inflation to come. This shipping cost uh, chart will mean that, that particularly the price of imported products will be held down in the months and quarters to come. So, positive news there as well. Moving on to the next slide and what will central banks uh, do? Well, um, we're expecting to see a 25 basis point rate rise from the Federal Reserve, a 25 basis point rate rise from the Bank of England and a 50 basis point rate rise from the European Central Bank. I'd say that the UK and the European interest rate changes are pretty much nailed on. I think that that's, broadly speaking, what everybody is anticipating. Bank of England has been a little bit more dovish in their conversations um, about monetary policy going forward from here, and they have two very uh, high-profile dissenters um, on the Monetary Policy Committee saying that interest rates should rise no further. In fact, they've been saying that since 3.5%. Moreover, um, I think for the European Central Bank, it's unlikely they'll do, do less and also highly unlikely that they'll do more in terms of monetary tightening, um, given the fragile state that the Euroland economy appears to be in. The one central bank that might surprise us and still has the ability to surprise, dependent on what we get from the, uh, the non-farm payrolls report at the end of this week, is the Federal Reserve. They could go either 25 or 50. The markets are unsure. Uh, leaning towards a 25 basis point rate rise, it would take something of significant surprise from the labour market in order to prompt a Federal Reserve tightening of more than 25 basis points, in my view. However, the the prospect of an overall higher rate peak from the US Federal Reserve in the update of the dot plots could be the thing that triggers uh, a um, a significant change in the way in which currency markets view those interest rate differentials and therefore trade um, dollar against the other majors thereafter. So just watch out for that. Moving on to the next slide and looking at fiscal policy, we've got the spring statement. We've already had the, um, the pre-arranged leaks of what might be in the uh, the package of measures. There's one thing that I wanted to highlight, which is apparently in the OBR's forecast, they miscalculated how the uh, quantitative um, tightening would be captured by public finances, uh, in that they thought it might affect the, um, uh, the or might have an impact rather on the uh, deficit. It doesn't. And because it doesn't, they've made an error of around about £10 billion plus. There's also been an improvement in tax receipts as well, um, which is is, is stocking um, or or providing a greater stock of capital should the government wish to draw on that to provide additional help and support. But I think there's two areas that the the government are going to focus on in this spring statement. The first is on extending the energy bill uh, help to households. That's already been pre-announced. That's been trailed widely in the press. So bringing the um, uh, the price cap down to um, uh, two and a half percent. Uh, sorry, two two and a half thousand pounds, rather than the predicted rise that was uh, was likely to take effect. Um, there is also likely to be an awful lot of debate and discussion about a planned twelve and a half p rise in the fuel duty rates, um, which was scheduled for. Uh, for for, uh, March. Now, they might reduce that, they might postpone it, or they might cancel it. But I think they will do something to try and limit the impact of that fuel duty increase, because it will be very unpopular and it will add to the cost of living issues. I don't think there's going to be much support for businesses or households. That may come in November time, um, and they're going to want to run a pretty tight ship on the public finances. Um, But there should be more money for the NHS to help clear the backlog of operations that need to take place. There should be more money for defence because of the amount of support there 
they're offering to Ukraine. So those are the key areas that I think will be in focus when we get the spring statement next week. And then if we move on to the final slide, which is the forecasts, um, we have marginally revised down our forecast for sterling against the dollar and euro against the dollar in the short term. We're still looking at our longer term forecasts. Um, there are also some some changes to our, our dollar yen forecasts as well. But overall, I think the key thing here is, is that we have seen uh, a stalling of the progress of sterling and the euro against the US dollar in recent weeks. Um, and consequently, that does create a, an element of doubt as far as the financial markets are concerned about the upside potential, particularly for sterling dollar. I'm not sure that there is that much additional upside potential for that particular currency pair. Euro dollar, because of higher interest rates and the closing of the interest rate differential that's expected, there could be more constructive behavior in euro dollar as we go through the quarters. But sterling dollar, I think that there are some additional downside risks here. And I keep sort of mentioning watch for the volatility that we're seeing in the Chinese renminbi. It's currently trading in the 690s. Um, I think that there is a risk that we see a more prolonged period of Chinese renminbi weakness, not because of the performance of the Chinese economy per se, but because I think the emerging markets are going to be under a lot more pressure, um, particularly with additional rate rises that we get out of the US. So we could see some additional emerging market currency sell-offs um, and, and dollar strength there, which could have a, a, an impact on the way in which the Chinese renminbi trades. With that, I'm going to finish up um, and hand over to Piers, just uh, noting again the podcast that some of my colleagues are doing. Um, if you haven't uh, listened to it yet, I'd, uh, I'd refer you to that. Um, some good stuff for you to listen to there if you're, you, know, you want f uh, further ad uh, additional views. Uh, and commentary, um, you feel that, that what Piers and I provide is insufficient. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll leave you with my disclaimer, um, which is the next slide, and pass you on to Piers. But thank you very much for listening to me, and I look forward to your, your questions at the end. Piers, over to you. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, I, today I'm going to look mainly at monthly charts, and uh, one thing to note that the market has gone into sideways consolidation over the last couple of months. And what do I mean by that? I mean, people always want to know, are you going higher, are you going lower, and have targets on the upside, downside? Well, last year was good because we had a directional move in most markets, so you could push those targets out and say, look, we should be going to these targets. We then had a reversal, and the market reversed back, and it hit the targets we're looking for there. But for the last two or three months, that counter trend against last year's big trend has sort of stalled. And so we've gone into a consolidation uh, mode, and you'll see that on most of the slides we look at today. So now the market has to try and decide, right, was last year's move the move we want to continue, or was it just too strong and we need to retrace a bit more? And so we're going to look at some key levels on the monthly charts to try and help us decide that. What is important this month is that when this month ends, you're going to end the first quarter of the year. And to me, that's gone very quickly. And so next month, we can look at the quarterly charts and get a, an even stronger steer on, right, what does it look like the course for the markets will be going through the year? So we go to the first slide now. This is the dollar index, and it's always worth starting with the dollar index to see what's going on in the world. Now, we can see that large move up from 2021, the move higher on the chart, and then that pull back lower down into the sort of 50% area. Now, the last two months, you'll see on it, it's just gone sideways. But last month was a very strong month, so you actually got a counter trend bounce back up. And why was that? That was because on this chart, I've put on Bollinger Bands. So the Bollinger Bands, how they are, you have a pink line in the middle on this chart, but it's, uh, you have a 20-period moving average, and along with two outer bands, which are two standard deviations. And this suggests that when the market gets to two standard deviations, it should sort of tire, but it shouldn't exceed that too much. But then if you fall off those bands, you normally come back towards that 
20 moving average. Now, I've highlighted that going back on this chart to 2013. You can see that it's always gone back to that 20 moving average, which has acted as support and resistance. So we saw that last month that the dollar index hit that 20 moving average. It found some support and it bounced off that. But it's gone up to this 105 area, which was the top of the month before in December, that area. So it's just doing a little pull off that 38.2% as it sort of decides, is that as far as I can go? And it's heading back down slightly now. But while my view on the dollar index is that while 98 and that 101, so that pink line in the 61.8 at 98, while that holds pullbacks off this 105, the risk is we could see a, a move up towards the 107, 108 area where resistance gets tougher. It will be stronger for the dollar if it gets back up there because that was a very negative candle last year that had the fall down. So that's the dollar index. If we break below 98, then you should look for dollar weakness to come. But at the moment, the 98, 101 area seems to be holding a support. If we move on to the next slide, we have euro dollar. Now, I put two slides here, so I won't spend too long on each slide. I'll try and sort of split the time. But this slide, what I like about this slide, it, it has the two trend lines. Now, these were two trend lines we were watching at the start of 2022, and it held. So it's a trend line since 2000, it's the black one, and there's a pink one behind it, which is a trend line since 2017. When it broke last year, that was the start of the collapse down here, down towards going sub parity. So you got that break of the trend line. You then get a retest towards the trend line. And that's what we had. We saw this move back up. But as it got close towards those trend lines last month, it starts to back off and fall back lower. So the last two months has been a sideways move, but negative, because last month was a negative month. But it's still to get this 106 area, which is sort of support. So I'd watch support initially around the 10580 area, 10580 area. And then if it breaks below that, I'd see a test down towards 102, 104 on the monthly chart. I think you could see that play out. So where does it actually change that we are going to get that look lower? I think if you get a move back through that 109 and a half area, then that wipes out last month's negative feel. And you're probably going to go back up towards the trend line around the 112.75. It's going to be a much harder year to call. And so you need to keep watching the monthly, these webinars, the weekly charts, the daily charts, and catch when these levels are breaking. Because last year was directional. This year is going to be jumpy, I feel. So if we look at the next slide on euro dollar, here we have the Bollinger Bands again. And this again shows the same thing we saw on the dollar index. Look, we went off the bottom of the bands, back up to the 20 moving average, and we're falling off it. So again, 108 is there as the mid area. So that 108, if you start to get above that, if you get a monthly close above that, then you're probably going to go up, test that 109, 45, and maybe go up towards the 112.75, that, that, that trend line area. But while you're below that 108, maybe we're going to see a bit of a euro dollar move to the downside. And if we go to the next slide now, we're going to look at the sterling index. So I know the majority of you all are UK corporates and you're all interested more in what's happening with sterling. So looking at the sterling index is good because rather than just look at sterling dollar and euro sterling, this gives you a chance of what's it going to do against most of the current currencies, the majority. And this chart, I like the monthly chart, and it shows why sterling has stalled over the last few months. Now, it might be difficult to see this on the, the small screen, but when you, you get these slides afterwards and you'll see it quite clearly. We had two trend lines here, the pink and the blue trend line. Now, if you draw those two trend lines, some people will use that bottom spike that I don't like in 2016. But some people will use that and take those spikes on the bottom side. I prefer to use the blue trend line, which goes through the absolute no and correct low, whereas the spike, no one's quite sure where that low was in, 
in um, Sterling in 2016. But if you look, they both come in at the same area. We broke below it last year and then got a very strong move lower. Then you rallied back up to the trend line. Neil tells me that strong move low has something to do with politicians, but it doesn't matter. You broke the trend line the month before. You then had a massive move lower. Then it rallied back up. Then it went back to the trend line. And it's held that trend line. The rule of polarity, old support becomes resistance. And it hasn't managed to clear that trend line. So when, if you want sterling stronger on a, and you want a quicker view, you want to watch this monthly chart, can it get above that trend line? It should really, I feel, have gone by now. So you had a, a nice morning star formation in that circle over those three months where you broke the big spike down and then rallied back up. So there is a chance this, this does rally back up. It was that morning star, but at the moment, it can't break that trend line. So while it can't break the trend line, you're just sideways at the moment. And I think the easiest thing is to say above the trend line positive, Below that 23.6 at 62.20 on the monthly chart, then the negative feel comes back and we're going to see sterling start to weaken again. And if we look at the next slide, I don't normally do the quarterly charts, but the quarterly chart for sterling index, I think, is so important. We can again look at those two, two trend lines. So trend line off the, the bottom spike, trend line off the quarter afterwards. And you can see they give you a nice range, and that range has held since we got the break of the pink trend line. So you can see where, if you want sterling stronger, you want to see it above that pink trend line. Holding above the pink trend line, the trouble for sterling is just above that pink trend line, something we always cover on the quarterly charts, is the 38.2%. So it has quite a big battle. But if it wins that battle, then there's a lot of gains to be made. But at the moment, it hasn't. It's just between the pink and the blue line. And those have held it for the last couple of quarters on the bodies anyway. So that's sterling. Looking at sterling, you can see why it's sort of sideways at the moment on sterling. And if we look at the next slide, this is sterling dollar. So I'm actually starting with a slide from last November. And there is method in my madness. And on this chart, I highlighted the inside session, usually a reversal. You had a good long downtrend for over a year, and suddenly you got this reversal signal, good reversal signal, and we put those two lines on, the pink dash line, the black dash line, and that was the sort of zone to look for. Now, I know a lot of economists and strategists have these clever computer systems where they put in data and they put what they think is going to happen. They put all this data and it gives them a little rate at the end and that's, that's their view. Mine was just a bit more basic, just two lines. Let's look at those two lines. And the, the reason this is important, because if we look at the next slide here, we can see that price has moved up to those two lines and it's stalled at these two lines for three months now. So that's a long time to stall. And we didn't have to look at any big Mac index or put numbers into a little computer system. It's the rule of polarity. And if you're looking at markets, it's always very important to know where you've been before and what's happened before. If any of you have been on a pub crawl, you'll know when you go into a pub, you know, which pubs you like and which ones you avoid. And this is very much like this. So you can see on the side where the st uh, chart starts, we have four black circles going across. Every time sterling dollar went down to that area, the market bought it. And they bought it in 2017, they bought it in 2019, 2020, and the initial time it got there in 2022. So it's just one of those lazy areas where you buy long term and you should be fine. But suddenly last year, you broke it. And I've highlighted that with the red arrow. You broke below that zone. And the market crashed off lower. So suddenly from sort of the 120 area, which had been holding it, it crashed down towards 103. Then it rallied back up. And this is why it stopped here. It stopped here because that rule of polarity, old support has switched to resistance. So it's very important to see what happens here. Is the market going to fall off that area and try and make new lows? 
or is it going to say, no, actually, I want to go back into where I used to live up in the sort of 127, 130 area? So watch those areas carefully, 12160, 12360. And I've watched that as my resistance. And then where's support? Well, I quite like that 38.2 line. If you look, that's held it for the last few months. And that comes in at 118.38. So let's watch that area as the initial support. And then where it went on that first inside session, the top of that, which is sort of 116.47. So you have a two cent support area and a two, two cent resistance up at the top. And we can see that price has just traded between that for, for three months. So let's not try and be clever. What you actually need is a clear breakout of that, and then you get your signal. Above that, it opens up 127, potentially 132 area. Below that, then that's looking poor, and it looks for sort of much lower levels, and we can talk about that even when it happens. So on the next slide, just I've stuck on the Ichimoku cloud. Always handy to know what's happening with the Ichimoku cloud. We saw price rally up, but it didn't break through and hold the Ichimoku cloud. It actually touched the bottom of the Ichimoku cloud for two months and then fell off it. So that's just another thing that sort of keeps it at the moment, just that it's got a bit more work to do if it wants to go higher. But that cloud is now starting to move up higher. So it can sort of move back up towards that 130 area if it can get through that 12360 area. But just start with the 12160, 12360 as resistance, support 11647, 11838. In between that, you're no man's land, really. You're just in that sideways range it's been for months. If it gets outside those, that's when it gets interesting. That's when you need to take more attention. If, you, if you're worried about you want a higher sterling dollar, if it goes below that 11647, then you need to be concerned, vice versa on the top. If we look at the next slide, the next slide is euro sterling. And I know everyone likes sterling euro, but the euro sterling chart works better than the sterling euro. I don't know why. I think it's because it's the one that's traded. Even though it's supposed to just be just the inverse, it doesn't work as well. We've got that black uptrend line. It's holding that black uptrend line. So at the moment, the buyers are buying the dips. So you are still technically in an uptrend. But you are approaching the 61.8, 76.4% area, retracement area. So in that area of 89 to 90, that's where there could be resistance. If it starts to get above 90, then sterling starts to weaken quite a bit more. If you see price down below that dash trend line, then if you want a stronger sterling, you can start to be happy. And it gives a, and, and the one thing to remember on a trend, a trend is considered intact until it's given a clear signal that it has stopped or reversed. So we need to see that clear signal before we start saying, oh, look, th th this trend has broken. And the next slide is just simply on the sterling euro basis. It's, it's the same sort of thing, same sort of levels. You know, as you approach 111, 112, you'd hope to find some support. If that support doesn't arrive, then you're in danger of going down towards the 108.30. But to get positive, you want, really want to see this start getting back above 115, 116. And that's it from me. Uh, oh, yeah, the next slide, actually. I always forget this one. This is the disclaimer. Thanks very much for listening to the webinar. We hope you found it informative. The next in the series will be available shortly.